like at some point years ago because like Patrick said when we met today and we were talking uh, not only do we know a lot of the same people but like we're literally from the same hood damn near like Newark, Belleville, like we're born in the same hospital. You were born in Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, and we're, gen we're, 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 you know, generate, we're like a generation apart, but um, I think, you, you know. You say that, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to get over on like the 35. <laughs> um, but it, I, I think it's, it's, it's great because tonight, you know, this is our first time collaborating. And um, so basically what I did was, um, you know, Patrick has a piece and uh, there was a piece of music that I made and um, it just so happened that the two pieces kind of like fit really well together. So um, yeah, we hope you like what you hear. Yeah, so I, I'll just say a little bit. This is come, This is a poem, it's a longer poem from my, um, from uh, a book of poems that's um, finishing up right now. Um, and I just want to say a couple of things. One is that, um, poetry can be hard to understand. Um, I think you're, you'll get some of the things that are happening in here, but just enjoy the sounds, first of all, of, the, of, of what's happening, but you can also see images and allow yourself to see the images of the poem. Another thing that I want to say is that this is a poem about boys. I think we're, we're in a period right now where we really have to think about boys and what kind of men they become. And one of the great misconceptions, I'm around publishing and literary people all the time. And every year, at least once a year, I hear boys don't read. And when we condemn them to that, what we are saying is that boys don't have interior lives. That's a lie. Even when we're not reading books, and I bet you this is true of ill too, we were studying other things. I was a body kid, and so I needed to study through sports, I needed to study through dance, I needed to study through music. And all those literacies made me a writer. I wrote four books now. So don't tell me that there's, they don't have the capacity to read. I think that we need to publish more books, and we need to be open to the idea of, of boys reading. And you know, not for nothing, but it's connected to the kinds of male violence that we're seeing in the world. Um, I thank God that I have books and music and writing for me to reflect on my life. And, um, and not for nothing, but maybe even save me from the violence that I practiced for many, many years, well into my 20s and 30s. So that's just a little bit of introduction to this, to this poem. It's called, Boys, Bodies, and Flight Are Also a Kind of Text. These kids run their sloppy fly routes right to left in a crabgrass park. They are counting by the thousands. They read the defense and cheat the rush or jump the snap. One of them eats a nice blindside hit from a slightly older, bigger kid and buckles for half a second, then jumps to his feet. You might not notice the big kid brush the shorter one's shoulders before he shoves the littler guy good and hard and hustles toward the huddle. When I was their age, there were days no one for nine blocks could come out to play. So I used to ride my bike to Gray Street and sit alone in the middle of the baseball field, standing up once in a while to pitch dirt bombs at the church's back wall. It's glass stained with the long robed saints of Bonham Town and a few undecipherable aphorisms of the Roman faith. Among my first urges toward ruin, to crack open an enclosure, holy or not, and set free what might roost inside. I'd imagine slinging a rock through one of the saints' heads and a plague of grackles streaming from the breach. 
the birds rushing out a lot like gangs of brawling boys do, spilling across an avenue underneath a second floor neon Szechuan sign. How many times I was swift to headbutt another kid in the chin or mush some brat in the face who I thought was breathing too hard and too close to the bar. And so with a quick swat, I could set a whole downtown plaza ablaze with crews of crackling boys pouncing upon each other. Under street lamps, I bet we'd look like jackdaws, stomping out flames, or rooks simply mauling smaller birds. Someone told me the key to peace is learning to make my mind still as a feel. Like maybe the one from my childhood with its crumbling backstop across from the abandoned cosmetics warehouse. I've often wondered if the jagged painted glass of Grace Street Church is finally nailed shut with some cheap chipboard. I keep thinking the roof is probably collapsed by now, but I'm really remembering a shrine near my mom's hometown that was bombed by Americans who thought the enemy was hiding inside. When the townspeople came to see the damage, there was a real sky in the gaping space left in place of the original sky frescoed on the dome which had fallen in. More wondrous than that, the attack knocked loose a huge statue from its perch. The 10-foot saint cut from local stone landed on its feet and was poised at the center of the altar and thus forever blessed the site with enough power to invoke a pilgrimage by the grown sons and daughters of the nation's latest dictator. They knelt before that hard white figure to request their several intercessions, sobbing, prostrate, and surrounded by men strapped with armor lights. By then, the local engineers and artists had been called to fix the image of heaven, the shadows of small black birds now fleeing paradise along the sun rays, golden angles of descent. I was brought up on the other side of the planet, in a Jersey neighborhood whose one field was quiet long enough to bear the silence of a 75-year-old church and a solitary nine-year-old boy testing his scrawny arm and the inherited pleasures of rage. I was 25 when my mother died. It would be several years before she came back for a quick visit. We met in that field by our old house. A bare maple lay on its side between us. She somehow figured I was hungry, so she turned to a line of bushes near the crown of the fallen timber and whistled. Three notes into my mother's call out burst a half dozen fluttering inkwell, so quick to flight they impaled themselves on the bare branches of the fallen tree. My mom held out her arms as if to call my attention to the flapping bloody fruit. There are no photos of my mother before 1958 year she arrived in America. I think as a child she must have been very much like the children in our ancestral village who once accompanied me to the family cemetery. Even there, these children dart from grave to grave, reciting their own names and the distant years carved by hand. They leap from one hard marker to another, laughing in brigade. They laugh like hundreds of flocks once locked some musty space made sacred by so many small bodies crashing into glass. Doesn't anyone know of boys who dream repeatedly of wings? And yet so few of us know what to tell them the morning they wake up and feel what it's like to be changed by pain. Every generation there's another kid on the wrong side of the world who stops praying in a dusty field to lift a stone so he can begin to understand what it's like to wish for the same thing for the
the rest of his life promising to spring every body of every ghost from every shackle and every old wood hole. It took me decades to salvage my sadness from books. Tell me again that boys don't read. It is their hothead fathers and stubborn uncles who are too terrified to listen, let alone inscribe the fleeting stories that would name the first secret agony of those little bones poking through their backs.